Hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Fitzpatrick. I am the Shepherd of the Lambs. Uh, the Lambs located at 3 West 51st Street, where we've been since 1976. We're not a public restaurant on 44th Street. We are the oldest professional theatrical organization in the United States, started in 1874. If you want to find out more about us, you can look for us on the web. We're also on all kinds of social media as well, too. Um, just a couple of things we have coming up at the clubhouse because we're a very busy social organization. Wednesday, April 19th, and I don't know if Julian ever produced any hippo drama. Anybody know what hippo drama is? I no, uh, not only do I not know, but I know I didn't produce it. <laughs> <laughs> it's horses on stage. <laughs> In the 19th century is quite a big thing. So we're gonna have uh, the expert on hippo drama uh, at the 19th. The 21st is our spring frolic on Friday the 21st. Uh, Sunday, April 23rd, we're going to Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx for a cemetery tour. It's our second annual. There's more than 100 lambs who are permanent residents of the Bronx. We drive around and visit everyone from urban Berlin to George M. Cohan to Victor Herbert. And May 4th, I'm really excited about this. This is also brought to us by uh, Lamb Magna Cats. Chris Hart, the son of Kitty Carlisle and Moss Hart, will be at the Lambs. So if you have any questions or you want to find out more about the club, just drop us a line. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can post a message and we'll get it. But I would like to turn over the talk to our good friend and fellow lamb, film expert, educator with the headphones. Please welcome Foster Hirsch. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, appreciate that. Looking forward to this discussion. I'm holding up a book that we're going to be talking about. Note it well, because after we talk, you will want to go on to Amazon and buy it. It's called Try Not to Hold It Against Me, A Producer's Life by our guest, Julian Schlossberg, who wears many hats in addition to being a producer. And we're going to talk about all of them now. But Kevin, let's start. Uh, tell me why this title. Well, try not to hold it against me. I work with a lot of controversial people, people that I uh, very much loved working with, but they have reputations that have changed uh, in my in my lifetime. Number one, with Woody Allen, I produced most of his plays uh, and loved working with him. And I can say immediately that people said uh, he was impossible or people couldn't talk to him. And none of that was true with me. We could talk, I could speak with him. And in the book, I tell about a couple of people he turned down in casting. And I went back to him and asked him if I could, he would see him again. And he said, I'll see him as long as you think, or well, one of us say no or yes. And we brought him back and he hired a couple, not all, but there were three and I got two out of three. So I, I left at that point. I thought that's enough. Um, Alan Klein, I consulted for Alan Klein, was the manager of the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. And I ended up uh, working with him. He had a very mixed reputation, but I he was always fine with me. And that was great. I uh, worked with Aaliyah Kazan. Aaliyah Kazan, as many of you know, was one of the great directors, one of the few that could conquer both theater and film. But he did, during the McCarthy period, name names. And finally, there was a kid in... Buffalo, New York, who was a rock and roll promoter. And he uh, came to me to learn the movie business. And he was smart. He was a street kid. And I liked him and he had taste. And I never expected him to go to the heights he went to or the depths that he sunk to. But his name was Harvey Weinstein. So there were a lot of people that I worked with that uh, at, at this juncture, some people might not like. Uh, Three out of those four, I would work with again. But the, the title then refers to people holding it against you for working with people they might not like. Exactly. Right? Okay, but I thought the title might be okay, uh, being angry with you because as a producer, you do things that are not going to always be universally popular. Well, we both know, Foster, that producers uh, have a reputation of being fat, with a cigar going after girls. I mean, we know what the uh, okay. what the reputation is. So it, I, I wouldn't. I wasn't concerned about that aspect. That's not how I kind of operated. On the other hand, try not to hold it against me. A producer's life might be provocative enough for someone to say, "Well, let's see what he did." <laughs> that's it. that's how I took it. So I was reading a book, thinking you're going to tell us the, the things that you did that were controversial, but that's not what I'm hearing. 
No, so I, I, misread, I misread the title, I have to tell you. I misunderstood it. I just, well, you just explained yeah. it to me. <laughs> well, I'll have to go around the country now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Talking to people and say, no, yeah. I didn't mean that. You didn't mean that. I meant this. Mm -hmm. but let, let's go back to the beginning, because when I, I said in the introduction that to, to say you're a producer isn't entirely accurate. You're a producer, but you're sort of a jack of all trades. I mean, you... You were a kid from the Bronx who loved movies and entertainment and theater and television. It, am I right? You were you were simply in love with show business as a kid in the Bronx. I was, and I confess uh, at 81, I'm still in love. I'm still in love. I, I've been very, very consistent. I've always been very, uh, great admiration for the talent of the people in show business. Uh, many of them really, especially actors and actresses who go out there and really are reasonably naked. And while they can only blame perhaps the agent, by and large, they're out there alone. And I uh, have always been uh, fond of actors. It's one of the things I'm happy to say that, as they say, some of my best friends are actors. Um, yeah, it's uh, entertainment was always exciting to me. I remember my mother being extremely annoyed that I brought in Variety at 10 years old. She didn't like the idea. She wanted me to be a professional. She, we didn't say what professional what was, but that's what she wanted. Foster, my concept was a simple one. I knew I wasn't going to get an accounting or a law degree. I wasn't going to be a doctor or a dentist. So I thought I better learn all the aspects I can of show business, anything I could read, anything I could learn so that I knew knowledge would give me at least some sort of power. And and, and uh, that's what happened. I just studied it all and ended up working in radio and television and doing acting and producing and directing and and owning a record company. I mean, a, a lot, a lot of things. You, you you did everything, but but the book makes it clear that you got some very important jobs at a very young age. You were in a top position at Paramount very early, and things happened for you and doors opened. What is it about your personality, would you say, if you can step back from it, that made you have success or gave you entree to important positions at a, at a young age? And basically, they didn't know who you were, but, they, but important, powerful people had an instinctive trust of you. I have to say that from reading the book. What was it about you? Boy, that's a good question. I wish I had a good answer. I don't know. I don't know. I know that the radio show that I did, I was in my, I guess, 30, 31, and I did it for nine years, uh, really helped me meet an enormous amount of people. Because I had Bob Hope and George Burns and Betty Davis and John Huston and Jack Nicholson. I mean, I had the biggest names in show business sitting across from me. And that was incredibly exciting for me. And perhaps, oh, I know one thing. I, I cannot tell you how many people who came on this show said to me, I can't believe you read my book. I can't believe you saw my movie. I, I said, why? They said, because we go around the country and they just give them a sheet of paper. They never seen it. And I went and saw it or read it. And I, the word got out that there was somebody in New York and the show was syndicated. So we were in about 20 cities uh, that read and did care about the people coming on. So, yeah, I guess maybe that was part of it. I don't know, Foster. I but, really don't. But that was part of it. But I got a sense, too, that you were not intimidated by the world famous. You, you treated them as people and you were able to talk to them without getting scared or intimidated or frightened or insecure, that you held your own with world famous and even as you say, sometimes difficult personalities, but they yeah. didn't scare you. No, that, that's true. The only person who scared me a bit was Margaret Truman, <laughs> oh. of all people. Of all people. She was so, she was so not, she so did not want to be interviewed by me. And her son, I think Clifton Daniel III or something, had convinced her that I would do a nice interview. And but for whatever her reason, she was pretty intimidating. She, she didn't like uh, being interviewed. I, didn't, I don't even know why she did it. I guess because of him, I guess. Yeah. But tell us about your um, early experience at Paramount. You were in a very top position for a short time. 
but you were yeah, in the top well, position had, of Paramount. What what made you leave so quickly? Well, I was really unhappy. That that can help, you know. Yeah. Uh, I what happened at Paramount would have happened at any studio. It was the studio system itself that, while people cared about making movies, it was not primary. Primary was to perpetuate your power, and if you could knock someone out of the way to go a little higher. Now, that seems to be, sadly, a lot of corporate uh, structure, not just in studios, but in corporations throughout the country. Uh, I'm going to be dropping names, and I don't mean it that way, but they're the people who I've met. Gore Vidal said, remember, Julian, we are in a brute capitalist country. It's not just capitalism, it's brute capitalism. And he's right. He's right. At least that was my experience. So I I was hired by a, the smartest executive I ever met named Barry Dilla, and, and uh, we got along rather well. But I said to him after my, I had a two-year contract, and after the first year, I said, Barry, I want to leave. And we settle with people all the time at 50 cents on the dollar, and I'd like you to uh, settle with me. And he said, no, I, I don't want you to go. I enjoy, I enjoy working with you, and uh, I think if, I, if you'll stay, I'll figure out a way that we can be happier. And I said, but uh, it, it's not working. It's not going to work. See, I couldn't say yes. I could say no, and I could say I get back to you, but I couldn't close. And I had come from the Walter Reed organization where for years I was in charge. I could close. So I ended up, I wanted to run a studio. I thought I would run a studio, but I found out fast that I couldn't run a studio. Not that I didn't have perhaps the capability, but I certainly didn't have the stomach for it at all. So the, the funny thing with Barry, and, and I have to say the last time I saw him, we laughed at it. I said to him, he said to me, why, what, why are you so unhappy? And I said, I'm diametrically opposed to everything you do here. And he said, diametrically? <laughs> <laughs> and so we both laughed. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't paramount per se. None of the studios would have worked for you. None of them. None, None of, them of them would have worked for me. No. What, I, it wouldn't have worked. No, not, not for who I was and who, you know, I mean, it, those are pretty tough waters to swim in. And having been a Bronx kid, I came from the streets. I could go the low road. I just didn't want to. I didn't choose to. I, and I, I really wanted to run a studio, but I found out that I, I couldn't. Then I ended up getting involved where I almost was going to run a studio, but that's a, Another chapter, Foster. Okay, but now tell us about something you did run for decades, Castle Hill Productions. Yes. Tell us, tell us, that's not a studio, you were a distributor, but tell us about that. Yeah, it, well, we were a production company and a, and, and a distributor, but basically a distributor. I was, a, I really was at six and sevens to borrow uh, the Philip Nolan, I was a man without a company. And I had spent most of my life with a company, in fact, all of my life, with ABC, with Walter Reed Television, Walter Reed Theaters, and then Paramount. And now I was going to go out on my own. And I was quite nervous about it. And I had two friends, two great writers, Herb Gardner and Elaine May, who took me out and I voiced my concern. And I'll never forget what they said. They said, look, you open up the store and we'll help you fill the shelves. And that was really a made a great difference to me. The fact that two well-known fine writers were backing me, at least emotionally, and perhaps with some screenplays, um, made a made a big difference. So I opened up Castle Hill, and many people say, "Oh, I know you're from the Bronx," and I am because Castle Hill Avenue is a very big avenue, but it had nothing to do with Castle Hill Avenue. My name is Schlossberg in German. Schloss is a castle. Berg is a really a mountain. I had gotten, I couldn't take Paramount's mountain and I didn't want to start with a mountain. I thought, well, let me start with a hill and maybe I can go up. So that's how Castle Hill got its name. Nothing to do with the Bronx. And yet I am a Bronx boy. No question. What were the, what were the films you distributed that all these years later, you're proudest of? Well, I think probably Orson Welles is a fellow would be one of the most because it languished for 40 years. And uh, his youngest daughter, Beatrice, came to me and said, would you consider getting involved in 
help refurbishing this film? And I said, I sure would. Now, they had had a nice group in Chicago who had re-recorded the music note for note with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But when I still got the version that they sent, while the music was great, the, the film was out of sync and all over the place. And, and I just didn't want to release it that way. And I was fortunate enough to be friends with Lee Dichter. Lee Dichter is a great mixer. And he mix he mixes Mike Nichols films, the Nora Ephron films, uh, the, the best of Robert Benton, all the New York great directors, Woody, all work with Lee. And I asked Lee if he would uh, look at a film that I had, and he said, "I'm totally booked. I can't at all." I said, "Well, I don't want you to work on it. I just want you to look at it." And I, the first reel of a fellow is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Photography, music, everything, and he looks at it and he turns to me because I knew Lee Dichter was an artist, is an artist. And he looked at that film and he said, you son of a bitch. OK, he said, I will mix this, but it has to be at night and on weekends because I'm totally booked. But I, I want to be while I want to be involved in this movie. So my scheme worked, Foster. And yes, uh, uh, the Othello was released worldwide. I had the worldwide rights. We went to Cannes and showed it uh, 40 years after it won the, the Grand Prix at Cannes. And it was a wonderful evening. And I was at the Palais. One of the funny things about Cannes was if you go there with a picture and you're nobody, you know, no, nobody knows you, there's one million photographers, people screaming. They don't even know what they're screaming about. They're just screaming because you're there. I mean, it's like that's their job. Their job was to come in front of the palais and scream whoever they were taking pictures of, because obviously they didn't know me at all. But it was a quite an exciting moment, I, I uh, must say. I, I share your enthusiasm for Othello, which is a glorious film. It's fabulous. I'm so and I glad. visited the city in Morocco where Wells shot it. Have you been to Oswera in, in Morocco? I, I, yes. Uh, I, what happened was the king of Morocco invited us and it was the first time and probably the only time I've met a king. Um, and uh, yes, we had had an outdoor a showing of it. Oh, that'd be and I walked on the I, ramparts. Yes, I walked the ramparts of where he shot it. He also yeah. shot it in Venice uh, as well. As uh, well. But, yeah. you know, in in the city in Morocco, there is a square called the Orson Welles Square and a commemoration of the shooting of that film. But yeah. did you make money from Othello. Actually, yes, we did. We you did. did. Yeah, which is not, which is generally not like me, but uh, somehow. <laughs> you actually somehow made some money from that one. Yeah, that, that one we did okay with. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, that, I have a picture in front of that uh, plaque that you're talking about. Yeah, and, yeah. and, uh, and then uh, Beatrice, his, his youngest daughter, and I went to uh, where he was buried. We went to his, uh, his uh, burial place. Uh, uh, it was nice because I ended up for a while running the Orson Welles estate. And that was very exciting. Uh, but I had to give it up because of the fact that Orson Welles could give a, a, have lunch with someone from Romania and sign the menu and say, okay, you can have the movie. I mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> there were too many, too many problems with it. I, I am friends with uh, Orson Welles' oldest daughter, Chris, who lives right around the corner from me in Greenwich Village. She's oh, lovely. Yeah. Do you know her? No, no, I've no, never met her. I, never read, I think I read her book, though. Yes, she wrote the book. A, a wonderful book. Yes. I was very interested in your uh, chapter, and I wanted more, actually, on Kazan, because he is just about my favorite director. How oh. you met him, the way he treated you, and how and the and the continuity of your relationship. Tell us about that. You met him in a very Bronx kind of way. Bronx boxy, I would say. It took a lot of courage to do it the way you did it. Or, or a little stupidity, too. But, well, well, he, but he, well, tell I us I mean, about let's, it. Say, let's say this before I tell the story. I would be arrested now for what I did. <laughs> but anyhow, in 1966, for whatever the reason, it couldn't have been a very exciting weekend for me. I was looking through a telephone book of Manhattan, and I thought, I wonder if they have him, Kazan's name in the book. And there he was with a, at that time, a, a, a B next to it. It was a business address. And I decided 
to go and see if I could just talk to him. And I went over to his office, which turned out to be uh, behind the cashier's booth for the Victoria Theater at 46th and Broadway. I went inside and looked at on the on the board of the where his name was. His name was not there. So I waited outside and he came out. And he I was my, I'm about six feet. He's about five, six, five, seven. So I was quite taller than he, but I was afraid to say anything. And I followed him. And I followed him all the way home on the west side. And the next day I waited and I followed him a second day uh, to his home and I was afraid to speak. And then the third day we got to 49th and Broadway and he whirled around and he said, who are you? What do you want? And why are you following me? And all I could do kind of a la Jackie Gleason, ah, bah, 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 bah. I, could, I couldn't even talk. He said, come on, I want to talk to you. Come back. We're going to go back to my office for a talk. And we went back to his office and he said, well, what is it? What do you want? I said, I want to work with you. I don't want to, anything. I don't want any money. I just want to be around you. I want to learn from you babbling on like a crazy person. He said, well, there's a lot of actors who are willing to do that. I said, well, I'm not an actor. He said, well, who the hell are you? And I went into the fact that I'd worked at ABC and I was working at a theater company. He said, did you ever hear of a movie, A Face in the Crowd? I said, sure. Andy Griffith, Patricia Neal, Walter. He says, well, I know who's in it. I made it. He <laughs> said, how about Baby Doll? They started to say, call Molden, and I was cut off. He said, I'm getting those two pictures back from Warner Brothers. That's part of the deal I made. That's how big he was, Foster, that after 10 years after he made the movies, they would revert to him. That was coming off on the waterfront, why he got that yes. deal. And then his first movie was East of Eden at Warner's, so it worked out well for Warner's too. And I said, yeah, I think I could do something with him. Uh, and for whatever the reason, I'll never know, he ended up giving me those two movies. Uh, trusting this young kid who was 24 years old to take these two movies and handle them. I once asked him, how come? What was it? What did you see? What He said, Julian, I spent my whole life casting. He said, I thought you were something that you might do well for it. So that's how it happened. And uh, I, I handled it to the, dot, to the day he died. We never had a contract. It was just with his firm handshake. But based on what you said, Foster, on the second book that I'm writing, I'm going to have a whole chapter on him again, because I left things out that I want to put. I, I was going to mention that you you mentioned Kazan and, of course, his extraordinary gifts. But I was sort of relieved that you didn't go into the politics. But you mentioned the politics in your introductory comments today. Yes. But it was almost a relief that you didn't tar and feather him for being a friendly witness no um, well, it's so it's very complicated i don't i feel it's very easy to to say who did right and who did wrong about that period now it, no one no one got away with it nobody everybody, everybody suffered no matter who i became pretty close with zero mostel we lived in the same building and he was fun and wild and if you brought up that period oh my god it was like Slowly, I turned. It was a whole different man uh, because it really scarred an enormous amount of people. And uh, I only once brought it up with Kazan, and I write about that in the next book. <laughs> but you, but you made the decision not to include it this time around. I did. I you did. Made that decision. You I didn't did. want to include it this time. That's right. That's so right. You, you represented those two films, and you distributed them. Yeah, I represented them worldwide for, I guess, almost 30, more than 30 years. Yeah. And, and, and it was Kazan belief in me that started other people. When You know, now that the question you asked when we were much younger, uh, well, uh, I think that was probably one of the major reasons that, the, that if I had the imprimatur of Kazan, where people knew I was representing him, it made a huge difference. And I think that's probably... If I think about it, and I am thinking about yes. it, that's that's what I think yes. started it. Yes. And so he instinctively trusted you. He did. Uh, he did. And, yes. and and wrote a I'm very proud of what he wrote in his book, his wonderful book. If if people in show business who love show business have never read A Life by Kazan, that is a book. That is a book with all the war. He talks about 
the good, the bad, and the ugly. He tells it all. Uh, it doesn't hold back at all. At all. And he wrote, you know, a wonderful in gratitude and admiration. And I'm very proud, uh, proud of my relationship with him. And as we both know, how many directors, maybe on one hand, we can talk about who were brilliant in theater and film? Mike Nichols, Kazan, maybe Orson Welles, not maybe Orson Welles. Yeah. Arthur Penn, Penn was in your book. He yeah, was a major right. figure in your book. Arthur Penn did very well, too. Yes. What, what, what was interesting to me in, in your, your uh, serendipitous career is that all of a sudden you started producing in the theater, but your goal had always been television and then movies, but then you end up doing a lot of work in the theater. The, the theater can't get rid of you. So what <laughs> happened? <laughs> what happened? You well, just, and you, and it happened by accident or you sneaked into it? Or how well, did you get your start in theater? What happened was uh, Renee Taylor and Joe Bologna came to me with a play they had written and they they wanted to read it to me and they and they read it to me one night and I loved it I thought it was great and Renee not being shy said to me why don't you produce it I said oh Renee I, I've never produced a play I don't know how to produce she said so you'll learn on our play <laughs> so I uh and that's how I got involved with Alan Klein I I knew Alan from the Walter Reed days I asked him to listen to this play and they performed it and Alan took me into another room and said, uh, have you ever produced a play? I said, no. I said, have you? He said, no. He said, well, look, we'll learn together. I'll put, <laughs> up, the money. I'll put up the money. I'll put up the money. I mean, these are the words that any producer lives to hear uh, if, if, you, if you're not talking to someone who's psychotic. And he wasn't. So the idea that he would put up the money, and that's how it began. We opened on Broadway. It was called It Had to Be You. And uh, we ran for a few months because of him. And the irony of this of, <laughs> shows you about timing. Fly, Clive Barnes was the reviewer and gave it the most incredible review you want to read. However, he had left the Times two weeks before and was now writing for the New York Post. Frank Rich came in. He didn't think it was so good. So if I had, we had only opened a couple of weeks earlier, we might still be running. But you really got burned in a way, but you got a taste of theater that you've never gotten rid of. I mean, there's yeah. so many plays that you've done and you're still working in the theater, but your great benefactor, in fact, I, she's almost the co-star of the book, right up there with you is Elaine May. Obviously, she wrote the introduction to the book. She's your good friend. She's obviously a, a dear friend to you. She comes off magnificently in the book. She has no nonsense. I mean, she's, she tells it like it is, but you're crazy about her. Oh, she's, I can't even begin with the exception of my wonderful wife. There is nobody on the planet that I love more than Elaine and no one I respect more. I mentioned how smart Barry Diller was as a <laughs> executive. Well, I've met a lot of smart people in the world. No one, Elaine is genius. That word is thrown around all the time, but this woman is a genius. And the idea that she believed in me may, gave me the spinach to Popeye. I was able to say, oh, if she thinks I'm pretty good, I must be pretty good because she's really good. And I mean, think of, think of doing your first movie, as she did, that she wrote, directed, and starred in. That's her first movie. She had never done a movie before. And it turns out to be a new leaf. And if you look on Rotten Tomatoes to this day, it gets a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And that was her first film. So I could go on and on. And actually I do in the book. <laughs> you do, on. but you do, you talk a lot about the, the one act plays that you did with Elaine May, David Mamet, Woody Allen, Ethan Cohn, power plays, relatively speaking, uh, which I saw. Uh, and I thought they were, they were terrific, but one act plays are not, known to be box office i mean to even even no, no matter who the authors are to even think of doing a one-act play isn't it a kind of madness yeah i think that's part of my makeup <laughs> i i just love the i love the one-act plays and i love working with the people you just mentioned i mean they're the finest of them all 
Um, and if I can't get a regular play out of them, I'll take a one act play. But yeah, I think I probably I would think and you'll probably know better than I, I do. But I think I'm the only producer who has put on one act plays in the last 30 years on Broadway. I think I'm it. You're uh, it. And off Broadway, too. Yeah. And off, off Broadway, Broadway too. as well. Yeah. As well. The um, I grew up with uh, Bob Anderson's, you know, I can't hear you when the water's running which is one of the great titles. And I find that out. I'm saying that every week with my wife. So I know that title <laughs> works. But no, I love doing, I love one, one acts and I'm glad I was able to do them. Um, uh, and especially with Elaine and Woody, who I did two or three or four, I don't know how many at this point. Yeah, but a lot. You. But yeah. now you're, you're a, 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 a theatrical producer who very much believed in Off-Broadway. You had the Variety Arts Theater. You worked at the Promenade. Uh, that's a different world now, isn't it? Off Broadway now is not what it was when. No. At the time, you were you were doing regular presentations no. off Broadway. That's that's absolutely true. I had uh, I was courting my wife in uh, England. My mother thought that was so funny because I wouldn't go to Brooklyn to date a girl, and now I was flying to London. Mm. But I, and we went to see the. I, went to see the last production of a play with Penelope Wilton and Eileen Atkins that had been recommended to me called Vita and Virginia, about the relationship between Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West. And I fell in love with the English language. I forgot how beautiful our language can be, especially when you're using Virginia Woolf's words. And Eileen Atkins not only co-starred, but actually adapted it from their writings. And I wanted to bring that over to to New, to New York. I wanted to bring it over, and uh, I went to the producer, and he said, uh, "What do you? I just lost, or as he said, I just lost a hundred and ninety thousand pounds uh, on the move." I said, "Well, I want to bring it over, but I don't want the same director, and I love Penelope Wilton, but I'd like Diana Rigg to do it." And he said, "Oh, that's interesting." He said, "Well, what if I could get Vanessa Redgrave?" <laughs> I thought. This guy's in a little office. I figured he has about as much chance as getting Vanessa Redgrave as I do. And I said, well, if you get Vanessa Redgrave, yes, uh, we'll do it together. And I went back to New York, and two weeks later, he called, and he said, I got Vanessa. And I was shocked. And then, of course, to show how little I knew, he had been her son-in-law. He had been married no. to Natasha uh, before uh, Liam, before Liam Neeson. And and that's how it began. We broke every record in the history of Off Broadway with the two of them. Uh, and the irony was that I ended up not wanting to be, but ended up being the biggest investor in the show, because Vanessa had recently gone on the air on the Academy Awards and had talked about the PLO. And my investors were mostly of the Jewish persuasion and they did not want to be involved with Vanessa Redgrave. I said, isn't there a statue of limitations? And they said, no. So it, I ended up having to put in the most money, but it turned out a, a happy ending for me. But a lot of sleepless nights before that happened. <laughs> was she was she difficult or easy? Vanessa yes. was, was fine. She was great. Uh, but I had Zoe Caldwell as the director. So I had that advantage. Uh, she was... Uh, she certainly knew what she wanted, and no one was going to tell her what to do. Uh, but most of the time, we kind of all agreed where we didn't. She asked me to give her some notes one night, and I was very pleased and very surprised that she wanted any notes. And I went backstage, and I gave her, she had a, I remember a nice yellow legal size pad. She was taking the notes down very, very seriously. And I, she thanked me and I thanked her and I left. And I, and I had the feeling, I didn't turn around to see this, but I had the feeling as soon as I left, she had taken the notes, crumpled them up. And <laughs> them away. That was my feeling. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I did check after a couple of days to see if any of my notes had been taken and only one out of about 12. <laughs> didn't, bat, she, didn't bat very well. Was she aware of all of the resentment? Uh, against her in the, the Jewish oh, community, she, oh, yes. she was fully aware of it. Oh yeah, she she was certainly aware of it. But Eileen, of course, was a doll. Eileen Atkins was 
she had adapted it and she did take notes and we did go over the script a lot and uh and zoe was terrific to work with as well but zoe caldwell's husband robert whitehead was the man i fell in love with uh the finest i think one of the finest human beings i've ever met just a wonderful person who was the original producer of death of a salesman among everything his his work is spectacular and at the end of his life once every three four weeks we would have lunch and it was a great great pleasure to work and get to know a fine 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 producer if anyone doesn't know him and is interested look up robert whitehead you'll see credits you cannot believe that one producer could do the most uh, sustained and surely entertaining part of the book where you can't put it down is your actually long and detailed chapters on the casting of sly fox oh, yes. i mean you you're, you're a very tactful man i suspect that's part of the reason you've gotten as far as you have in in show business but your your mask of tact drops in those chapters yeah and I, there I, you, there's some i mean after reading that would anybody ever want to work with burt reynolds for instance i don't <laughs> think so well certainly if, they'd have a lot of trouble now working they would have a lot of trouble now but yeah. would you have written that if he well, was no, still it wasn't, with us it, yeah and it wasn't just burt reynolds i mean i really let it all hang out not to hurt anyone or not to be mean-spirited but if people are interested in producing uh young people especially they should know that it's not the glamour that it may appear to be and i show the people who promise and then don't do and the people who say yes and then renege and there's a lot of things that go on and i i kept copious notes because i hoped one day to write a book and uh and th and there it is uh it's funny that you mention it because I, <laughs> I I I didn't know Burt Reynolds, but I called him and my message to him, because I didn't get him on the phone, I left a message, which was, uh, hi, Burt, my name is Julian Schlossberg. I'm a New York City producer. Try not to hold it against me. That's how <laughs> and that's that's how that came. But, but you I, got his attention. You did get his attention. Well, uh, yeah, and we got a, we even got his commitment, and then we didn't have his commitment. <laughs> uh, we were going to play. We were going to play out of town. At that point, I believed in taking every play I did, a new play out of town, to work out the kinks and to see what would be helpful. And um, we were going to go to the Rich Forum in in Stamford, Connecticut. And I I end the chapter with Burt Reynolds before I start the next one with. But a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. <laughs> and that's that's what happened. He, he said goodbye. <laughs> now, was Richard Dreyfus easy to work with? I've heard otherwise, but you don't report any negative activity. No, I had no problem with Richard at all. In fact, we got along famously. Uh, no, I didn't have any trouble with him. I had trouble with certain actors. But, you know, it's very important to point out and, and I'm not being an apologist for actors, but it may sound it. But actors, by the time they make it, are damaged goods most of the time. They have been rejected. They have been lied to. They have been screwed so many times that the time they make it, their anger is still there. It's not as if it just goes away. Okay, now I'm, I'm making money. But what they've been through. And so, yes, I, I feel for, for them. And I... So I think that's perhaps why they know it. And, and, but I recognize what they've been through, the rejection and the lying. And, and I mean, I've tried very hard not to have actors come back more than two or three times. But I know of stories where actors come back 12 and 15 times and then are still turned down. It's a, it's a tough life. But boy, if, you, if you're lucky enough to work with talented people who are not too crazy <laughs> we're all a little crazy we're all a little nuts um it's uh it's a it's a pleasure so yes i would say that that's one of the reasons that i i have been able to <laughs> annoy a tremendous amount of agents because i go to the talent i don't go through the agents or the manager and it's not because i don't like the agents or the managers i have the relationship with the talent uh, and i call that the talent the actors, the writers, and the directors. So, 
that tell us about Fortune's Fool, which was an oh. unexpected success, a Turgenev play on Broadway, a new Turgenev play with with two stars. Yeah, that, that tell was, us about that. That was such a. I had worked with. Uh, I had, I had tried for years to work with Arthur Penn. He would send me something he wanted to do. I didn't like it. I'd send him much more I'd send to him that he didn't want to do. And I was working with Alan Bates and Eileen Atkins in a show called The Unexpected Man, written by Yasmina Risa, who wrote Art. And uh, and Alan and I got along very well, uh, but he never mentioned Fortune's Fool to me. But an actress who had brought me the play Fortune's Fool, Rita Gam said, you know, um, Alan is interested in this play. I said, Alan is interested in this play? I'm working with him. He's never mentioned it. Well, ask him, she said. And I asked him, and he said, yes, he was. Wow, I thought, this is great. So I got, I got it to Arthur Penn. And Arthur, I expected the usual no. And the next day, he called me. He said, I'll do this play with you. Well, I, you know, I, I almost said, what do you mean? <laughs> What you, I'm so used to a no. <laughs> so I said, great. And then we tried to get um, the, the co-star. And uh, I went to uh, Derek Jacoby, who I had, who I loved as an actor. And, uh, and uh, he said, I'm coming to New York. I was talking to him in London. He said, let's have uh, lunch and we can talk about it. And he came and he said, you know, I've done Fortune's Fool in England. I said, really? He said, but I want to play the Alan Bates role. I, I, I let Alan play the other role. I said, no, no, no. I Alan's going to play that role, but I wish you'd no, I, I, I don't want to do it. And Arthur suggested uh, uh, Frank Langella. And I was a big fan of Frank's acting. And uh, I reached him in London. And he said, I want to meet a man who would put a Russian Turgenev play on, on Broadway. <laughs> I said, well, first read it. See if you want to be as crazy as I am. And, and he did. He read it. And he called back and said he would do it. And it was nice because, as he said, Julian, I'm doing Moon Over Buffalo in London with Joan Collins. This will be definitely something for me to do. I'd be really happy to do it. And we had a very interesting meeting, Frank and I, the first time we met. Uh, I, I went to him because he has a next a mixed reputation, uh, but I'd never seen him anything but peerless as an actor. And I said to him, what do you expect from a producer? He said, what? He went back in his chair. I said, what do you expect from a producer? He said, well, I've never been asked that question. I said, well, I'll tell you what I expect from an actor. I'd like you to know your lines and any problem you have, you feel you can come to me as long as it's not about you, it's about the play. If you'll do that, he said, okay, and I'll tell you what I want you to do. Never lie to me. I've been lied to all the time. And I said, I won't. And I, I think we both lived up to our promises to each other. I was thrilled, Foster, when the play, Alan got nominated for the Tony and won. Frank got nominated for the Tony and won. And we ended up being uh, put on as best play, uh, nominated for best play. Uh, Thanks to my co-producer, Ben Sprecher, we were able to, they first said, no, it's an old play. You can't put it on. And Ben said, wait a second. The rules are simple. It's a new play for Broadway. It's never been done. We don't care how old it is. And he won. Ben won and we were nominated for best play. So, And I saw it. It was a terrific production and, and it was a popular success. Yes, People liked it, it. People enjoyed the show. It, it was quite, and the reviews were like nothing I've ever had before or since. Yeah. It just, it was a, a great, great uh, production. And working with Arthur was a thrill. Arthur Penn taught me something. You know, all these people teach you something. And if you have a brain in your head, you try to retain it. But Arthur said, if an actor you've never heard of comes in and nails the role like you've never seen, you better get him back a second time. He said, because that could be lightning in a bottle. They could have just had it. He said, and just at least bring them back a second time, which is interesting. Also interesting to me, over the years when I've cast with a director, uh, somebody would come in and do a very good job and then come and do the play. 
and we spent to spend the whole entire time trying to get them back to how good they were at the audition. It's interesting. Most of the time, of course, they improve. Actors improve because they're rehearsing. But, but, but I've, I've heard it said that if the audition is terrific, that's the performance you're going to get. Or sometimes yeah. you're better off going with an actor who's promising, but not there yet in the audition. Well, that, that's an interesting thing. I, I don't, I'd never heard that. Uh, maybe. Uh, I would say that uh, all the directors I've worked with and gotten to know and even interviewed, they all say the same thing, that the uh, directing is 80% casting. 80%. That's a lot. And it's true. Because I've been where I have been in the situation where we have someone who's just can't do it, cannot do it. We made a mistake. And you, you and the last thing I want to do is fire anyone. Um, I've only fired two people, uh, a, a Tony Award winning director <laughs> and a uh, and a Tony Award winning actress. But I'm not going to get into that. You'll have, okay. To, okay. you'll have to read the book to find out. Okay, well, that's that's a fair deal. Now, uh, would you say that your production of Bullets Over Broadway, the musical version of, of Woody Allen's film, which I know you were very involved in, would you say now that it's come and gone that it was a disappointment or did it, did it fulfill what you had hoped for? It, it did both. It broke my heart because I thought this was it, that I had finally... I had never gotten the gold ring. I certainly had some silver and maybe a lot of bronze, but I never had the gold ring. And I was so sure of Susan Stroman's brilliant direction and choreography and Woody's terrific book, the wonderful acting we had. I was positive. In fact, so much so that I would have put my own money in. <laughs> That's how sure I was of this, of this production. But it broke my heart. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I could say that this is four or five years ago, and I still haven't 100% gotten over it. One of the interesting things about producing... Why didn't it work? Why didn't it become well, the big hit? I, I, I can tell you theories, uh, but I, I don't know the answer. I'll tell you, number one, um, <clears throat> Ben Brantley did not, did not like it. Turned out that Ben Brantley is a very close friend of Mia Farrow's, but I can't say that's why, but... That certainly didn't hurt. What also happened was Mia, uh, having the anger she had towards Woody, waited till the day we opened the box office to have the little girl come out and say uh, that he that he did terrible things to her. So that didn't help us either, because we had a pretty good uh, uh, advance going in. We had about six or seven million dollars, uh, but that was a in a crazy way a, a dead giveaway because I felt the least we'd get is eight to nine. So the idea that right off the bat, we didn't get the advance I was hoping for, even though it sounds like a lot of money. It, it sounds like a lot of money. Yeah, but- A lot of money. But when your budget is 14, it's not too much. You know, you want to you wanna feel you're covered a lot of that budget. And the bu the right now, the budgets on Broadway are just out of control. They're up to 18 and $20 million. And- uh, I could probably make seven or eight movies for that price. So it's, uh, it's, but the whole thing has changed, Foster. I mean, both of us have, have seen the change in theater, film, and television. But in theater, it's hard to believe that 70 to 75% of the public are tourists. They're not New Yorkers. They're not from, from Connecticut or New Jersey. They're tourists. And therefore, we've getting we're getting a lot of Disney Disneyfied kinds of plays and, and jukebox the, musicals. Jukebox. Well, I was I guess I considered mine also yeah. a jukebox musical, but I don't know. And you have a Woody Allen screenplay like Bullets, and you have Susan Stroman. I hope it's a little above that. But, so, but I'm but I'm wondering, Julian. I'm playing devil's advocate. If the absence of an original score hurt the show. If people didn't think it was, it had been carefully enough curated to, to have an original score for a, a Woody Allen property. Do you follow but what I'm saying? That, that not only do I know what you're saying, it, it, it's one of the reasons when you asked, I hadn't gotten through. Oh. That's another of that is another of the reasons that's given why. But I loved the music. That's the music I grew up with. 
That's the music I love. That's the movies Woody and Stro loved. We all love that music and we want it. They had great songs. And I uh, I have to say this, which is I sure controversial. I am not thrilled with 90% of the music and lyrics I hear on Broadway and haven't been for years. I love Rodgers and Hammerstein and Lerner and Lowe and Rodgers and Hart. And there's these people are pygmies compared to these great, great uh, uh, singers. Oh, I wanted, I, I, I didn't want original music because I didn't know who to hire, nor did Woody or Stro particularly. So, but anyhow, we, this is a long story about bullets. And I think I'm going to end up having to cry in my beer tonight now that I'm bringing oh, it up. Oh. So let's get off it. <laughs> oh, okay, well, we'll move on to the next uh, subject. But you mentioned Lerner and Lowe. And when we were chatting before, you said you were actually working on a musical about Lerner and Lowe with uh, Liza Lerner, Nancy Olson, and Alan J. Lerner's daughter. Is that correct information? That is correct. Uh, I went to John Law, who was the New Yorker critic and uh, who wrote a terrific play. And I went to, back to Susan Stroman and asked her if she'd correct, choreograph and direct, and she will. And we've done a workshop and then COVID hit and then My Fair Lady opened. So they wanted to wait and now Camelot's opening. So I, we get, keep getting pushed back, but I, I hope one day I can come on and say to you, we're opening in June or October. But it's about the collaboration between Lerner and Lowe. It's about them. It's uh, their story, it's how their they got story. together. Yeah. it's Because they met, you know, what we're, we're doing this for the Lambs Club. They met at the Lambs Club. So it's a perfect tie-in for our event tonight because That's Lerner right. and Lowe met at the Lambs. And I think some of the uh, profit from Brigadoon still is, is directed to the Lambs, if I'm not uh, wrong about that. I don't know about that, but I do know about the fact that we have a scene in the play where they meet at the Lambs. Ah, so perfect, so I, I perfect have a for this event. I was going to say, have a hunch, maybe we have to get the Lambs at opening night. We'll Absolutely. That. Okay. A major presence, a major presence, but I look forward to seeing that. I want to end with... Um, uh, uh, another project that you worked on that sounds absolutely fascinating, but it was interrupted by the pandemic, Witnesses uh, to the 20th Century. Yes. Can you tell us about that? That's very different from anything that we've talked about so far. And I've, I've said, and let me hold the book up again, one of the joys of this book is that we're talking to a man who wears many hats. He's a producer, but he's so many other things, a booker, a, a radio uh, interviewer but also a kind of amateur historian. And you have this extraordinary witnesses project. Tell us about it. And of course, Elaine May is involved in it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, Ken Burns's Civil War was an extraordinary piece of work, but it was the letters read by actors. And I thought to myself, wait a second, we've got great people on the 20th century. I, I'm going to do... I'm going to try to get the most important people I can to sit down with me and talk about their career. But it's going to be how the major events of the century affected them, but conversely, how they affected the century. And I was able to get, I, I, to this day, it boggles my mind, 140 people talking hours. I mean, we have I don't think there's anything less than an hour and a half, two hours uh, of President George H.W. Bush, Sandra Day O'Connor, Flint Eastwood, uh, Henry Kissinger. I mean, we're all over. We're all over. I don't care about Republican or Democrat. I don't care about any of that. I care about the people who made the 20th century, affected it, and how it affected them. And so I'm very proud of that show. It's going to be 14 hours. Uh, and I seems to be working on it since my bar mitzvah, but it's yeah. not. It's a, it's a, about seven, eight, ten years now. Um, and we're editing, and we're uh, we raised the money to do it. And Elaine is um, writing and directing. I am producing, and I did all the interviews. And I did the interviews without any notes, uh, but I sure studied the night before. It was like taking a college final, and I think. Uh, it was very interesting, Foster. We were kind of almost knee to knee. I had two cameras and we shot all of this. And 
we know the brain is a muscle. And if you keep talking to someone and they're not, you're not looking down and you don't have all these papers in front of you, you're just staring at them and they're staring at you. Things come out that I, I think they were shocked at. I was shocked at. I mean, I, I mean, I cannot tell you how many people said to me, I've never told this story before. And that to me was, oh boy, I, this is great to know that that is going to happen. So we start at 1900. Believe it or not, I found people in their hundreds who were articulate and intelligent to begin the show. And by the end of the first show, Robert McNamara, who's a kid, remembers the end of World War I about people exploding and laughing and screaming. And it was a fascinating uh, thing to take people through 1900 to 1999. Uh, seven secretaries of state. So there's an enormous amount, but I want to get the music of the, of the decade. I want to get in the uh, uh, newsreels of the decade and so that we show what was happening each decade, the roaring 20s, the depression of the 30s, World War II and the 40s, and of course, the unbelievable so-called 50s that were supposed to be, as Arthur Schlesinger says on the show, the bland leading the bland. But it's <laughs> true. It wasn't. It was a wild time, the 50s. And then the 60s, of course, we know were the wild time. So it's a it's a it's a labor of love. I'm extraordinarily happy I did it, but I've been having difficulty selling it. I've never done anything I couldn't sell, but uh, I've had comments like, "There's an awful lot of old people on your show." Oh. <laughs> I said, "Well, it's called Witnesses of the 20th Century, so I don't have Miley Cyrus. She's not part of it." You know, I mean, it's such a in, inane thing to say. You, you're trying to show. People, another person says, you know, you ought to have some pundits. I said, you mean you want me to have pundits who studied it rather than the people who caused it? I mean, uh, Elaine said, maybe you shouldn't be selling it. <laughs> maybe that's not what you're supposed to say to them. And I guess she was right. Anyhow, I'm very proud of it. I hope one day it will see the light of day. But no matter what, I have it. And uh, I do know the Library of Congress has said they will take it no matter what. But I'd like, so to, it, get it on, it I'd like be, to get it. On. But it will be an extraordinary research facility, at the least. Yes. But uh, you would like it on television? Yeah. Yeah, I want. I want yeah. it on television. Okay. I, I want to okay. see it. Okay. So we'll take uh, some I must questions, interrupt. Magda. Yes. yes. Uh, we, we're going to take four questions, and please make them short because uh, we'd like to uh, move on. Um, it, the one of the questions where, um, and I think I know it's. I'm going to. Combine it. Uh, have you worked with uh, Josephine Levine and Marlo Thomas? Oh, well, I've yeah, done a lot with Marlo. Marlo and I, uh, we did um, the movie In the Spirit together. And uh, she, is, uh, she and Elaine are my two sisters. I was an only child, and I picked up two sisters along the way. And they, in fact, at, at my wedding, they signed, they are the two witnesses to the fact that I married my beautiful wife, Marin. So Marlo and I have done that. We worked on Broadway together in Relatively Speaking, and we've gone around the country together doing plays. So yes, I have. I, I worked with Joe Levine, and I, I really liked Joe Levine. He was he was a tough, tough character, but uh, I wrote a, there's a whole chapter in the book about him, and um, he wanted to hire me, and I loved going to, I went to Rome, I went to uh, uh, met the Netherlands when he was shooting A Bridge Too Far. I went to Paris, London, all over the world with him, but I wouldn't work for him. He was too too tough a character for me. And uh, I didn't want to lose my friendship, but we were very close. And uh, he once um, on the, my radio, did my radio show. He did, I had a television show. He did my television show. And he said, uh, I'm going to call you the Jewish Johnny Carson. I thought, well, that's pretty good. I was glad he said that. No one else ever did. Um, the next question is, when you worked uh, with Elaine May, was that the time she already uh, she already had left uh, Mike Nichols, that they were not together anymore? Well, that's right. But they, they did come back together. Elaine wrote The Birdcage and Mike directed it. Elaine wrote Primary Colors and Mike directed it. So they did come back together. And they and um, Randy Newman, and Joan Rivers 
did the very first AIDS benefit on Broadway. So they came back together then. But I represent Mike and Elaine to this day on all their CDs and on their footage, their, their film clips. In fact, a few years ago, I sold, they do a wonderful thing on funeral homes, very funny on funeral homes. And I, I sold it to uh, 60 Minutes. They played it. So yeah, I, I, uh, I, love, I love working with her. And I loved working with Mike. Uh, I, I, I produced and interviewed Mike uh, for um, Mike Nichols, an American master on American Masters, and we were nominated for an Emmy. And Elaine directed it, and I, I produced it and interviewed him. And it was uh, an interview I'm one of the most proud of, of all the ones I've ever done. Okay, the final question. What was the hardest part of writing the book? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know if I'm a writer, but I think I am a storyteller. And I think as a storyteller, I was lucky enough to have told these stories for so many years that that, that became an easy aspect. What was the hardest part was to decide what I was going to talk about and what I wasn't going to talk about. Because, you, you know, you, you, I, I mentioned that title, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. That, that's really, again, what happened. That what, I had wonderful stories that are good, but then it's how much do I want to be self-serving about me? Uh, and bad, how much do I want to say how bad things had been or ugly? So I think the hardest part was to decide what stories I was going to tell. And as I told Foster before we started the interview, I'm halfway through the second book because I would remember, how could I have forgotten that story? How could I have not told that story? So I'm going to do the second book, and then that's it for me. Except I will do a book on the witnesses because I I'm going to take the, those, those, um, those interviews and make sure at least it's out that way, that a book will be done of these incredible people and their stories. You know, Foster, I bet you felt this the same way when you interview. You want to know where someone came from a lot, not just that they're successful, but where, how did it happen? How did it germinate? What was it like? Like you said about growing up in the Bronx, for example. You know, that's, that's important. And these folks were never asked things like that, it seemed. And so it, it was nice to watch them go back and talk about their influences themselves. So, so talking about influences and ending on this, uh, uh, Julian, tell us, having grown up in the Bronx, tell us about Crumbs. Oh, J.S. Crumbs. My, I used to think Julian Schlossberg is a crumb. J.S. Crumbs was across the street from the Lowe's Paradise. The best ice cream sodas, the best candy, two floors filled to make a little kid really have a sweet tooth. Uh, I remember that banana split and it was three scoops of ice cream. It was a great, great, great ice cream parlor, candy parlor. Well, thank you. That On that sweet note, <laughs> uh, I want to put my bid in for your next book to book you, uh, to come back to the Lambs. And we'd love to have you in person to do uh, sign some books. And I'm, thank I'm, you so I'm much. I'm in. I'm in. Oh, good, good. And I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, Kevin, do you want to say anything? I just want to say thank you to Julian. Good luck with your book and your second book. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.